Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's one of those awareness days. It is World Hemophilia Day, at least for the next 45 minutes or so. So I'm going to talk about hemophilia for two reasons. The first reason is my son actually has a mild form of hemophilia. The second reason is because the future is awesome and we are living in the future. And I'll talk about how those two things connect. What is hemophilia? If you don't know what it is, it is a bleeding disorder that causes you to bleed for a longer period of time when you are injured. It's probably most famous or most associated with various royal families in Europe a couple centuries back. They all ended up with uh, male members of the family dying of hemophilia complications because they interbred with each other. Most types of hemophilia are genes are defective genes that are on the X chromosome. And if you know anything about how the X and Y chromosome work, the Y chromosome is a little guy and the X is big. So it's one of these genes on the longer end of the X chromosome. Uh, so a male won't have the corresponding gene on the Y chromosome to cancel out any kind of defect. So it tends to afflict males much more than females. And so for that reason, it also tends to skip generations. Um, there's a couple different types and there's various severities of those types. So the first type is called hemophilia A, which is a deficiency in what's called factor eight. Second type is hemophilia B, which is a deficiency in factor nine. Both of those are important enzymes that allow the platelets to stick together when you are bleeding. And you actually have little bleeds throughout your body all the time. You may bump your arm and get a bruise and not realize it, or you have a blood vessel burst uh, in your joints in a lot of cases. For a person who has really severe forms of hemophilia, that bleeding into the joint will cause arthritis and terrible pain. And what they have to have administered to them is a the factor that their body doesn't make. And you have to have it administered intravenously so it goes into the blood and it'll cause those platelets to stick together and stop a bleed the way a typical person's body would stop the bleed. As you can imagine, that's very inconvenient if you happen to have really severe hemophilia. Now, my son doesn't have hemophilia that severe. We can use factor if he gets an injury uh, as a preventative measure. Like if you get a bump on the head and, or if you were to get a concussion or something, you could give him factor and that would prevent any kind of bleeding in the brain or things like that. Uh, for other people, they have to receive factor every day sometimes more than once a day or you know every other day a couple times a week um, it's a it's a thing that they have to do in order to constantly keep up with their body's inability to um, to stop bleed so uh, the tendency to bleed or the severity of it is dependent on what percent of normal amount you end up having in your blood so Someone with less than 1% has severe hemophilia and they'll have a lot of issues with bleeding. Someone who has moderate, it's maybe, you know, three to 6% and mild, maybe, you know, 6% or to up to 50%. There's also a third kind of bleeding disorder that I guess I'll mention called von Wildebrand's, which is usually much less severe, but um, does afflict a lot of different individuals. And often they don't realize that they have it. And by the way, if you are a, a pregnant woman or you're a woman and you get pregnant, your factor levels will shoot up through the roof in preparation of the trauma of birth to help the blood stop um, stop flowing from when the placenta detach detaches from the uterus and all those sorts of things. So lots of interesting information there. What does this have to do with living in the future? Well, there's actually gene therapy for hemophilia now. And this is uh, for factor nine is what uh, they've run trials on. And I'm going to link a couple of um, uh, New England Journal of Medicine articles down below, and you can check them out if you want. Here's basically how it works is that they program a virus and they put in that virus the information for the gene. They, they encode in the genetic information uh, for the actual factor that your body doesn't make. The virus goes and infects a host cell. And if you know the way viruses replicate, they, they find a host cell, they attach to it, they inject their DNA in it, and the, the host cell will then be hijacked by that DNA and start making viruses. And the cell will burst and the viruses will go out and continue that effect. That's tends to be the way viruses work. And it's also part of the debate of whether viruses are alive because they tend to just be little strands of DNA that attach to, to cells. They don't have the typical parts of life. So what they did in order to create this is they used the type of um, a type of virus called the adeno-associated viral vector, which is, I think, a modified hepatitis virus. That's what our hematologist told me. And they put that gene in there. It goes and infects your liver because that's the, the tissue that tends to make um, or usually makes these, these clotting factors. And 
instead of taking the cell over to manufacture viruses, it instead takes the cell over to manufacture clotting factor. And so what they've been able to do is they've been able to give this to individuals that have really extremely severe factor nine deficiency. Their body's able to produce virtually no factor on their own, and they have to receive daily infusions into their bloodstream of factor to prevent constant bleeds, arthritis in their joints from the bleeds and things like that. And what they found is that when they did that, not only were there virtually no side effects to them giving them this vector, giving them this virus, it didn't make them sick, but it also produced, allowed their body to produce six to 10% of the total amount of normal amount of clotting factor. And once you get to that amount, you don't have to receive factor every day and you may not even need it if you're injured, even though it's, you're like, oh, it's, but it's 10%. Your body can, can function well on, you know, less than a hundred percent. So they, these individuals would end up only needing infusions for actual bleeds or actual injuries that they sustain. And that's, a result of us taking something that nature gave us. This is the the wonder of mankind when you stop and think about it. We have this thing called a virus that, that usually hurts us and we take it and we transform it to our own ends and we turn it into something that can fix a broken gene inside a person's body, can fix what's wrong with their actual genetic structure to allow them to avoid having to use constant medicine. And the fact that factor is even available is amazing as well. Um, most factors were combinant. And if you know what that means is that you genetically modify an organism, usually a, a yeast or, and I think they might use mouse ovaries or something for some different kinds of stuff. Uh, you genetically modify an organism to produce a human um, a human protein that you need. Uh, so in this case, you could use, uh, you know, insulin is done this way these days, rather than using trying to use animal insulin, you program a yeast molecule to make the insulin and it just, you know, you give it sugar and it makes insulin and you, you know, you, however, they, I don't know how the process works where they get the insulin out of the entire thing, but eventually you end up with insulin made by a non-human organism, but it's human insulin. They do the same thing with factor. It's actually really amazing. But now we're at the next level where we can genetically program a virus to repair or to replace defective DNA. And that is a pretty amazing place to be in when you stop and think about it. Um, there's a whole variety of genetic diseases that exist in mankind that could possibly have the same application provided to them. And it starts with um, this one small study of, of 10 people that basically had their lives completely fixed by the genetic alteration of a virus. And that is a really amazing thing to think about. So I thought I'd share that with you today. We live in the future. I'm a cyborg, you know, which is cool. I'm really glad for the existence of all these things. Um, and I'm very, very thankful for the time that I live in that I get to experience these things and that there's, um, you know, there's hope for people that have these sorts of diseases or have, maybe you have something that's completely unrelated, but this research will, could eventually go down the pipeline and something could be, could be created to fix whatever it might be broken, whatever genetic mutation you might have that um, might be harming harming you in some way or preventing you from having that full um, that full amount of health. So it certainly helps people with hemophilia to avoid really crippling uh, arthritis and things like that. When you have that severe hemophilia, your body produces almost no factor. So thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time. I really do appreciate the feedback on uh, all the videos, and I will be trying to get the next set of movie reviews out as soon as I can. Um, that's it. See you later.